Thanks very much. Good afternoon and happy day before St. Patrick's Day, also known as Budget Day. Um, most of you heard me talk about the budget before, so I'm not going to say too many things in opening uh, before we get to your questions. But we will remind you that this is what we're calling the America First budget. We had America First, an America First candidate. You now have an America First president, and it shouldn't surprise anybody that we have an America First budget. You've seen the details. Uh, as we talked about last week, $54 billion of additional defense spending. We have some more details today on where that money is going. Um, we're seeing uh, increases at the VA, increases within the Department of Justice for law enforcement, increases within the Department of Homeland Security for things that include border security uh, and immigration controls, immigrations within, uh, excuse me, uh, increases within the Department of Energy to deal with a nuclear triad, and then corresponding reductions in similar amounts offsetting dollar for dollar uh, in other programs. Uh, the largest reduction, if you've seen the budget already, is a 31 percent reduction within the Environmental Protection Agency. The next largest reduction on a percentage basis is within Department of State, and the other departments are reduced um, in lesser amounts. I think the smallest reduction we have is NASA, which is just less than 1 percent. But there again, as with many of the agencies, you'll see certain line items within those budgets plussed up. Um, this is the message the President wanted to send to the public, to the press, to, the, to Capitol Hill. He wants more money for defense, more money for border enforcement, more money for law enforcement generally, more money for the vets, uh, more money for school choice, and then to offset that money with savings elsewhere so that all of that is done without an additional dollar added to the deficit, as I've mentioned before. This, this budget does not balance the budget. This budget simply reallocates and reprioritizes re spending as any family or business would do. This budget does not, for those of you who were not here last week, this budget does not address the big picture items such as policy changes, revenue flows, tax policy, mandatory spending. This is simply the top line spending budget. It's why we call it the budget blueprint. Uh, and not the full budget. That full budget, which will contain all the rest of those uh, pieces and parts, will be released in May. Um, before I take questions, I'm going to do something I don't ordinarily do, and I'm sure it's kind of new. I'm going to call on the New York Times um, because they're in trouble. Apparently, is there a, a where's my New York Times guy? Matt Flagenheimer and Alan Rappaport. Okay, are in big trouble. I'll give you the first question, but you have to deliver this message to them. They printed this morning that I am the father of 17-year-old triplet girls. My 17-year-old daughter really wishes that were happy, or really wishes that had happened, but my two 17-year-old sons are really upset. Um, so if you, could, uh, if you could clarify that, that would be great, and I'll give you the first question if, you, if you've got one. So go ahead. Okay, well, uh, we're not very good at math, obviously, at the New York Times. Uh, well, math is right. It's actually the gender that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, sir, during the campaign, President Trump, then candidate Trump, talked about uh, the national debt, mm -hmm. uh, which of course has reached around $20 trillion. You mentioned it in your budget message uh, this morning. Uh, is there a plan, as the President talked about during last year's campaign, to actually eliminate the national debt in eight years? He said during the campaign it would be easy to actually eliminate the entire debt, not the deficit, but the debt in eight years. Is that something that this president is actually committed to trying to do? It's a good question. It's a fair question. I would just suggest to you it's not the right time for the question. The budget blueprint, again, does not deal with the debt. It even doesn't even deal with the deficit. It is simply the first part of the appropriations process. We'll send this up to the Hill now and the, the appropriations committees of the House and the Senate. Of course, the House controls the power of the purse. The Senate, excuse me, Congress controls the power of the purse. And this will be the first step in that process. We will start to address the issues of the longer-term deficit, longer-term debt in that larger budget. And of course, we'll have to deal at that time with things like mandatory spending, tax policy, revenue flows um, to the government. So again, it's a fair question. I just don't think now is the time to ask the question. I have a question. The 28% uh, that comes out of the State Department, I know that you're leaving a lot of discretion to the people who are in charge there at all of these agencies for how to implement these cuts, but how much is intended to come out of the foreign aid budget of that $10 billion? A lot of it. Um, keep in mind, as, I, as I've said before, one of the reasons that you've seen such a dramatic reduction in the State Department on a percentage basis is not that this President thinks that diplomacy is not important. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, we've already seen that Secretary Tillerson has had a tremendous uh, one diplomatic success already on the deal he cut with Iraq. Um, the President believes in diplomacy, and we believe that this budget protects that core function of the State Department. It just so happens 
that much of the foreign aid that the President talked about in campaign, much of the money that goes to climate research, green energy, those types of things are actually in the State Department budget. If those line items had been in the Department of Commerce, you would see Department of Commerce having gone down by that, that by a similarly large percentage. So the answer to your question is that most of the cuts within the State Department try to focus directly on foreign aid. Yes, sir. Yes, the, uh, the budget showed a 0.8% decrease for NASA, but you've also talked about in the administration using private companies such as SpaceX, for example, for more of that. So does this show some, you know, is some of this going to be shifted over to the private sector, and does this show a commitment on the administration's part towards science and NASA? It does. Again, if you go back and you do what we did, which is go back through the President's speeches, the interviews he gave and just talking to him, we tried to identify his priorities. And he, one of the things he told us was, look, I'm still interested in America being involved in space, in space exploration. So even though the overall top line number at NASA is reduced by a small fraction, I think it's 0.8 percent, as you mentioned, individual line items that deal with specifically space exploration are actually plussed up. And part of the, part of the, the intent there is to promote exactly what you just talked about. Uh, yes, sir. Questions. Your own experience in the House tells you that a lot of these cuts haven't been voted for before. Do you consider this budget an opening bid, and do you expect a lot of pushback even from Republicans on the specificity and the size of these cuts? And secondly, to take your point about the President's words on the campaign, those of us who travel around with him remember, he said he didn't want to touch Social Security, Medicare, the big entitlements. The fact that that's not in this budget, is that a signal that those programs are going to remain untouched, and as the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget said, that ignores 70 percent of spending and 90 percent of its growth over the next decade. I'll deal with the second one first, which is the President is absolutely going to keep the promises he kept on the campaign trail. Again, you will see no reference in Social Security here, no reference to Medicare here, no reference to Medicaid here or any of the other mandatory programs, what some people call entitlement programs, because that's not what this budget is. This is the discretionary part of the budget, half of which, as you know, is defense and the other half is everything else, the alphabet soup of government. So just because it's not here doesn't mean we're dodging the issue. You would never see in any budget blueprint that deals with the top line spending numbers, Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid. To your other question about it not being popular on the Hill. Um, yeah, I, uh, I can recognize that. Uh, I've been on the Hill enough to know that some of these would be very unpopular. Keep in mind, the President is in a unique position. Um, I've been a member of Congress. I represented 700,000 people in South Carolina. I had my constituency. It was a district. Senators represent an entire state. Um, we're always dealing with special interests from back home. We're dealing with lobbyists from back home. The President is beholden to none of that. The President is, is drafted a budget for the entire nation because that's who he sees himself as representing. He did not have ask lobbyists for input on this. He did not ask special input, special interests for input on this. And he certainly didn't focus on how these programs might impact a specific congressional district. Um, but we know that going into it. Uh, and again, the message we're sending to the Hill is we want more money for the things the President talked about, defense being the top one, national security. And we don't want to add to the budget deficit. If Congress has another way to do that, we're happy to talk about it. Yes, sir, in the glasses. James Bates from Al Jazeera. The United Nations says the world's currently facing the largest humanitarian crisis since the end of World War II. 20 million people in just four countries facing starvation or famine. And yet you're cutting funding to the UN, funding to the foreign aid budget. Are you worried that some of the most vulnerable people on Earth will suffer as a, as a result. Now, we're absolutely reducing funding to the UN and to the various foreign aid programs, including those run by the UN and other agencies. That should come as a surprise to no one who watched the campaign. The President said specifically hundreds of times, you covered him, I'm going to spend less money on people overseas and more money on people back home. And that's exactly what we're doing with this budget. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, given your focus on dollar for dollar offsets in fiscal 18, in for your fiscal set, uh, fiscal year 2017 request, you didn't insist on dollar for dollar offsets. Why is that? Why are you not concerned about adding to the deficit in fiscal 2017? The um, the large part of the uh, the, the the point the, the question deals with the t 2017 request, which is a 30 billion dollar. I think it's actually three billion uh, billion and a half in there for the wall, um, and it's not entirely offset. There's a couple reasons for that. One of them is time. Um, another one is that some of that is what they call overseas contingency operations. Now, you also know that I have a, a somewhat uh, colored history with the, uh, with the overseas contingency operation, but I will tell you that we went through this and made sure that the money that's being requested is true OCO. 
uh, means that it's focused truly on the areas where we involved overseas, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, those types of places. So we have sent them $18 billion worth of proposed reductions for the 2017, uh, but not all of them were offset. Yes, ma'am. Melanie Garter, CNSnews.com. The President has called for eliminating funding for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Endowment for, for the Arts. Yet the Republican Congress sends the President appropriations bills that fund CPB and NEA. Will he veto those bills and tell the Republican leadership to send bills that defund those things? I think the message the President sent right now is that we want to defund those. And there's completely defensible reasons for doing that. It's a simple message, by the way. Um, I put myself in the shoes of that, that steel worker in Ohio, the, the coal miner, the coal mining family in West Virginia, the, 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 the mother of two in Detroit. And I'm saying, okay, I have to go ask these folks for money and I have to tell them where I'm going to spend it. Can I really go to those folks, look them in the eye and say, look, I want to take money from you and I want to give it to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. That is a really hard sell. In fact, something we don't think we can defend anymore. As to specific vetoes, you and I both know it doesn't come over one by one. Line item by line item doesn't come over. They come over in large appropriations bills. And we'll work with Congress to go through the appropriations process and we'll make determinations on whether or not to sign appropriations bills or veto them um, at the appropriate time. Yes, sir. In the several places in the budget where you're talking about eliminating funding for unauthorized programs. Yeah. Are you laying down a marker about unauthorized programs and do you think spending discipline would be improved if Congress authorized everything that it was? We hope so. For those of you who aren't, aren't familiar with this, we actually spend a lot of money in the federal government that's on programs that aren't authorized at all. Remember, the spending is sort of, to break it down, it's sort of a three-step process to spend money. You have to budget for it first. Um, then you have to uh, authorize it, and then you have to appropriate it. But a lot of the programs that we've spent money on for years have been unauthorized spending. Either they used to be authorized, actually most of them used to be authorized and then they simply lapsed, and some of them were just never authorized in the first place. They simply were appropriated without any authorization. And yeah, the message is that's not the right way to do it. Um, in fact, we think that's the wrong way to do it. You, took, you heard the President talk specifically on the campaign trail about at least 5% reductions for unauthorized programs, and that's what generated this budget. Right. Yes, sir. Director Mulvaney, you talk about this budget basically keeping the promises that the President made during the course of the campaign. The housing and urban development, uh, from housing and urban, de urban development, this budget blueprint calls for a 13% reduction, $6 billion. During the course of the campaign, President Trump said specifically to urban black voters, he says, what do you have to lose? It turns out what they have to lose is at least $6 billion that goes to many programs that benefit those communities. What do you say to those Americans who feel that, that promise? Nobody's going to get kicked out of their houses. Um, what we did when we looked at the, at the HUD budget was try to figure out a way to spend money better. And what we saw, and I talked to Dr. Carson about this just today, what we saw as we went through the analysis of the HUD budget is that a lot of their money got spent on government housing and building it. It's actually infrastructure. Okay? And what Gov Senator Carson, excuse me, Senator, what Secretary Carson and I talked about is figuring out a way to do that better. And as we did that, what we realized was we are working on a large infrastructure program that we hope to run, roll out this summer. And what Secretary Carson wants to do is take the money for the infrastructure that's in HUD right now and not very well run and move that into this larger program. In fact, you'll see the same line items uh, or similar line items in the Department of Transportation for the same reason. These, these do not mean the President is changing his commitment to infrastructure. Again, far from it. What we're saying is, look, for years and years we have built infrastructure like this and it doesn't work very well. So let me finish and I'll come back to you. And then so what we're doing now is we're taking it out of the discretionary budget and we're going to move it into the larger infrastructure plan this summer. But I'm, you know, yes. well, housing and urban development and the community development block grants aren't exclusively about housing. They support a variety of different programs, including in part Meals on Wheels that affects a lot of Americans. In Austin, Texas today, one organization there that delivers those meals to thousands of elderly says that those citizens will no longer be able to be provided those meals in those communities. So what do you say to those Americans who are ultimately losing out, not on housing, but on other things that are taken out of right. this budget? And as you know, I th or I think you know, that Meals on Wheels is not a federal program. It's part of that community, that CDBGs, the block grants that we give to the states. And what and, and, and have been many states make the decision to use that money on Meals on Wheels. Here's what I can tell you about CDBGs, because that's what we fund, right? Is that we spent $150 billion on those programs since the 1970s. These are these the, the, the CDBGs have been identified as programs since I believe the first, actually the second Bush administration, as ones that were just not showing any results. That we can't do that anymore. 
We, we can't spend money because, on programs just because they sound good and great. Meals on Wheels sounds great. Again, that's a state decision to fund that particular portion to it, to take the, the federal money and give it to the states and say, look, we want to give you money for programs that don't work. I can't defend that anymore. We cannot defend that anymore. We're $20 trillion in debt. We're going to spend money. We're going to spend a lot of money, but we're not going to spend it on programs that cannot show that they actually deliver the promises that we've made to people. So you're talking about programs that do work or don't work. There's a program called The Shine that's in Pennsylvania, rural counties of Pennsylvania that provides after-school educational programs for individuals in those areas, which so, this so happens to be the state that helped propel President Trump mm -hmm. uh, to the White House. I'm curious what you say to those Americans in a community where they tell me today that 800 individuals will no longer, children who need it most, will no longer be provided in those most needy of communities the educational care they need. I'm not familiar. Y'all are an advantage over me because I have to memorize all 4,000 line items. So fine. let's talk about after-school programs generally. They're supposed to be educational programs, right? I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to help kids who, can't, who don't get fed at home get fed so they do better in school. Guess what? There's no demonstrable evidence they're actually doing that. There's no demonstrable evidence they're actually helping results, helping kids do better in school, which is what, when we took your money from you to say, look, we're going to go spend on an after-school program, the way we justified it was these programs are going to help these kids do better in school and get better jobs. Be and clear, we can't that prove no that that's happening. We're, to be clear, we're saying the administration with this budget is saying that no after school programs out there are doing their job in helping educate these children. No, but I don't, I, and again, I, now you're asking me a question I don't know the answer to, but I don't believe we cut all the funding for those types of things. Thank yes, sir. Mr. Mulvaney, just to follow up on that, uh, you were talking about the steel worker in Ohio and the coal miner in Pennsylvania and, and so on, uh, but those workers may have an elderly mother who depends on. Uh, the Meals on Wheels program, who, who may have kids in Head Start. And yesterday or the day before, you described this as a hard power budget, but is it also a hard-hearted budget? No, I don't think so. I, in fact, I think, it's, I think it's probably one of the most compassionate things we can do to actually tell you. You're, you're, programs you're, help the elderly You're only kids. focusing on half of the equation, right? You're focusing on recipients of the money. We're trying to focus on both the recipients of the money and the folks who give us the money in the first place. And I think it's fairly compassionate to go to them and say, look, we're not going to ask you for your hard-earned money anymore. Single mom of two in Detroit, okay? Give us your money. We're not going to do that anymore unless we can, unless we can, unless we can, unless we can, unless we can guarantee, please let me finish, please let me finish, unless we can guarantee to you that that money is actually be used in a proper function. And I think that is about as compassionate as you can get. Yes, yes ma'am. I have a question uh, on the border wall. Sure. I'm Maria Pena with Love and Young. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, the budget, as I understand it, um, asked for $4.1 billion, so $1.5 for this year and, and $2.6 for the following year. Um, there's no mention at all of whether or not Mexico is going to help pay for it or reimburse the U.S. for it, as the President pledged. So where is that money coming from for the border wall? Uh, a couple of things. Your number is correct. It's one5 Five for 2017, back to your question about 2017, and I think 2.6 for 2018. People have asked me a couple of times, does that build the whole wall? No, it, it doesn't, but it gets us a start on the program, and you see some of the wall being built this year, and then of course, obviously we increase funding in 2018, but the wall will not will take longer than two years to build. As to the source of funds, that's up to the President and the Treasury and the State Department. I'm the folks, I'm the guy, we're the guys at OMB and the gals at OMB who take the money that we have and allocate it on a budgetary process. So it's up to somebody else to figure out where the money comes from. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, the budget uh, for DOJ zeroes out reimbursements for state and local jails holding immigrants in the country illegally. Some of that money now goes to sanctuary cities. Is that part of the President's promise to withhold funding from sanctuary cities? And are there other elements of the budget intended to carry out that punishment that the president uh, talked about? Yeah, honestly, I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular line item, so let me deal with the DOJ like this. And also Homeland, because there are some increases in Homeland that deal with this sort of topic. You're going to see an increase in Homeland for increase in detention facilities. It's a fairly significant increase in the detention facilities because we have, the president has said he wants to stop the catch and release program. In fact, he's signed an executive order to do just that. And we fund that. We increase the amount of money for detention facilities for folks who come into the country illegally. I'll give you a follow-up because I didn't answer your first question very well. Uh, to a, a question about the cuts you're making to things like transportation and housing. Um, you said those would be paid for later with other appropriations, but you said this would be balanced. And I know you've been a fiscal hawk yourself. It sounds like a bit of a shell game, though, where 
you're you're saying now this is a balanced budget, but you're saying you're not stopping to pay for other things because those will be paid for later. But then where are you going to pay for those other things? Right. And again, it's not, it's, doesn't all this stuff have to get paid for? And just to clarify, it's not a balanced budget. There's still be roughly a four hundred eighty-eight billion dollar deficit according to the Congressional Budget Office next year. We simply didn't add to that in order to spend more money on the president's priorities regarding moving projects out of the say the base budgets for the agencies and into the infrastructure. The infrastructure program is something we've just recently started. It won't probably come until summer or maybe even early fall. We have to do uh, Obamacare repeal and replace first, then tax reform second. That leaves infrastructure probably third, which may come after the August recess in Congress. Um, so I, 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 you, you're making an assumption that I'm not willing to make. You're making an assumption that all that infrastructure that we provide for later on in the year is going to go to the deficit, and I'm not willing to make that assumption. Yes, sir. Hi, Director. I have two short questions. One, <coughs> the blueprint provides uh, robust funding for embassy security. Yes, sir. As I the Benghazi Accountability, Accountability Review Board. Does that mean there will be an increase, uh, considering all the criticism that the President and Republicans uh, levied against President Obama for supposedly cutting embassy security? That's one of those line items that would leave up to, uh, to Secretary Tillerson. Um, he and I talked about the, uh, the, second, the um, State Department budget and how he decides to allocate that. It may be that there are some embassies that don't need a lot more security and some that do, some that do so we give him the flexibility to do that. The gentleman in the back had a question. Um, many countries around the globe did take very seriously President Trump that he will cut the phone aid because most of the countries getting U.S. aid were not with the U.S. supporting terrorism against the U.S. and also they were not voting with the U.S. So how does President Trump feel now about those countries? Will they continue the aid? Because the U.S. taxpayers have been asking that we don't have to spend on those countries who are against the U.S. Yeah, I, I, again, I come back to what the President said on the campaign, which is that he's going to spend less money overseas. Um, to your question, though, because this came up the other day, which is the hard power versus soft power, um, there's a very deliberate attempt here to send a message to our allies and our friends, such as India, and our adversaries, uh, with other countries, shall we say, which is that this is a hard power budget, that this administration intends to change course from a soft power budget to a hard power budget, and that's a message that our adversaries and our, our, uh, our allies alike should take. I'll take one more because I'm sort of running down. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. More about what message the president is trying to send uh, by eliminating a lot of funding for science and climate change, as you research, as you mentioned <coughs> earlier. Um, and just to follow up later when you have a chance to answer that. Sure. Um, a couple different messages when we talk about science and, and climate change. Well, let's deal with, the, let's deal with the, them separately. Um, on science, we're going to function. We're going to focus on the core function. Um, there's reductions, for example, I think, in the, uh, in the NIH, National Institutes for Health. Why? Um, thank you. Um, why? Um, because we think there's been mission creep. We think they do things that are outside their core functions. We think there's tremendous opportunity for savings. We recommend, for example, that a couple of facilities be combined and there'd be cost savings from that. Again, this, this comes back to the President's business person view of government, which is if you took over this as a CEO and you look at this on a spreadsheet and go, why do we have all of these facilities? When, why do we have seven when we can do the same job with three? Won't that save money? And the answer is yes. So part of your answer is focusing on efficiencies and focusing on doing what we do better. Regarding the question as to climate change, I think the President was fairly straightforward. That we're not spending money on that anymore. We consider that to be a waste of your money to go out and do that. So that is a specific tie to his uh, to his campaign. Follow up, yes, I'm sorry, you got to follow up. Now just really quick on Meals on Wheels. You mentioned that it's one of those programs you guys determined had not been uh, doing its job effectively. What evidence are you using to uh, make that statement? And is is not feeding seniors in and of itself? the fulfillment of the, and the My understanding from, from having been in the state government, and I, I may have this wrong, I've been wrong several times today, this may not be the first time, but my understanding of Meals on Wheels is that that is a state determination. We, we Federal government doesn't directly fund that. It funds the central uh, community development block grants, the CDBGs, and some states choose to take the money and do um, Meals on Wheels, other states and localities might choose to do something else with them. We look at the CDBGs, and when we do that, we look at this as $150 billion spent over 40 years with, with no, without the appreciable benefits to show for that type of taxpayer expenditure, and that's why we have the reduction. Specific 
to the CDBG? Uh, no, because I'm going to lap, lap. How Sean does this every day for an hour and a half, I have no idea. Um, but I'm going to. Uh, no, keep going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've been up since 4 a.m. this morning, so I'm going to turn it back over to Sean. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, guys. Around here, that's a half day. That's exactly right. <laughs>